The day we moved into the new apartment felt like a fresh start, a slice of the dream we'd been chasing for so long. Our new home was a spacious two-bedroom apartment bathed in sunlight, with a view overlooking a small, bustling park. Emily and I were overjoyed. We could already imagine our daughter Lily growing up here, making friends in the playground below. It was our little piece of paradise in the chaos of the city. As we started unpacking, a pile of unopened mail caught my attention, stacked neatly on the entryway table. It was all addressed to a Michael Harrow. We assumed forwarding his mail would be a simple act of courtesy, a final gesture to the apartment's previous tenant. But when I took the stack to the post office, the clerk's brow furrowed with confusion as she typed Michael's name into her system. I'm sorry, she said, glancing up at me with a hint of concern. But there's no forwarding address left for him. It's like he just... vanished. Her words sent a chill down my spine, but I brushed it off as an overreaction. People move away without leaving a trace all the time, right? But as I walked back to our new home, the seed of unease had already been planted. Little did I know, that was just the beginning of a series of events that would turn our dream into a nightmare. A week had passed since we settled in, when the first threatening message arrived. It was a simple white envelope, unremarkable, but for the way my heart raced as I tore it open. Inside, a single piece of paper carried a hastily scrawled warning, return what you stole or pay the price. The note was signed with a menacing flourish, but no name was attached. Initially, I thought it was a mistake or a cruel joke. After all, we were just a family trying to make a home. But seeing Michael Harrow's name at the top of the note, my stomach nodded with anxiety. Someone out there believed Michael, or someone in this apartment, had wronged them significantly. The threat was clear, and it was meant for him, not us. Yet with Michael gone and no way to contact him, the shadow of his past actions had fallen squarely on us. As days turned into weeks, the messages grew more frequent and violent. One morning we found a rock thrown through our living room window, with a note tied around it. Last warning. Shards of glass littered the floor like icy fragments of our shattered security. Emily's hands trembled as she swept them up, her eyes wide with fear. We started keeping the curtains drawn and double-checked the locks at night, but the sense of safety we'd once felt in our new home had eroded completely. One evening, while returning from a late shift, I felt the distinct sensation of being watched as I approached our building. The street was unusually quiet. The usual hum of city life dimmed as if holding its breath. As I fumbled for my keys at the building entrance, two figures stepped out of the shadows. Michael, you can't hide, one of them hissed, grabbing my arm with a startling strength. Panic surged through me as I struggled, but it was their next words that froze me in place. We know it's you, Michael. It's time to pay up. They were mistaking me for Michael Harrow. My heart pounded in my ears as I managed to break free, staggering back. I'm not Michael, I shouted, my voice echoing down the empty street. They paused, confusion briefly crossing their faces before they advanced again. It took all my courage and a sudden desperate sprint to escape them, ducking into a nearby cafe and calling the police. The police took statements but offered little comfort. They suggested that these people might not believe or care that I wasn't Michael. The realization was a gut punch. Not only were we living in Michael's shadow, we were now targets in whatever dangerous game he had left behind. Frustrated with the minimal help from the police, I decided to take matters into my own hands. The constant threat hanging over our heads was unbearable, and if the authorities wouldn't dig deeper, I would. I started by visiting the local library to access public records and newspaper archives. Hours of searching led me to a startling discovery. Michael Harrow had been a key witness in a high-profile trial against a notorious local criminal syndicate. His testimony had led to several arrests, but some members were still at large, their activities merely disrupted, not dismantled. The pieces of the puzzle began to fall into place. Michael hadn't just left a forwarding address, he had disappeared to escape retribution, and now, these criminals were after him, thinking he might still have evidence that could incriminate them further. Or worse, that I was Michael. My research uncovered more than I bargained for, dragging my family deeper into a dangerous situation. 
It was clear that these were not people you could simply hide from. They had resources, and they had motivation. As I sat amidst piles of old newspapers and legal documents, the weight of our predicament settled in. We were caught in the crossfire of Michael's unfinished business, and it was up to me to find a way out. One night, the illusion of safety was shattered when we returned home to find our apartment door ajar. Heart pounding, I led Emily and Lily inside with trepidation. It quickly became apparent that though our belongings were tossed about, nothing was taken. This break-in was a demonstration of our vulnerability. Our home had become the front line of a war we never wanted to fight. The following day brought an unexpected visitor. An FBI agent named Agent Thompson showed up at our doorstep. He revealed that Michael Harrow had been placed in the witness protection program after his testimony, which had led to a significant disruption of the Syndicate's operations. The resemblance between Michael and me was an unfortunate coincidence that had escalated the threat against us. Agent Thompson explained that the Syndicate likely believed Michael was still alive and hiding, possibly even that he had staged his disappearance to live freely under their noses. This mistaken identity placed us directly in their crosshairs. He offered FBI protection, but the thought of uprooting our lives was overwhelming. With the FBI now involved, our situation took a turn. It was no longer just about evading danger. It was about actively engaging with federal authorities to dismantle the lingering threat of a powerful enemy. Agent Thompson's presence offered a glimmer of hope, but the road ahead promised to be fraught with peril. The crisis peaked one evening as I was ambushed while taking out the trash. Swift and silent, masked figures grabbed me. A cloth doused in chemicals clamped over my face, plunging me into darkness. When I awoke, I was bound in a dimly lit, unfamiliar room, the stench of mildew in the air. My captors, rough and impatient, demanded information they believed Michael had hidden, documents that could further incriminate members of their syndicate. Desperation clawed at me, but a sliver of strategy took hold. I realized that maintaining the pretense of being Michael might buy the FBI time to locate us. I'll talk, but you won't get anything if something happens to me, I rasped, trying to emulate what I imagined Michael's demeanor would be. My heart hammered as I played the part, each second stretching taut with danger hoping my act would be convincing enough to keep me alive until rescue arrived. The gamble paid off. While I stalled, the FBI, using the bits of information I'd managed to provide before the kidnapping, traced my location to an abandoned warehouse on the city's outskirts. The hours I spent in captivity were agonizing, filled with a mix of fear and feigned confidence. Each minute felt like an eternity as I awaited either my end or my rescue. The rescue came with the intensity of a storm. Flashbangs erupted, disorienting my captors as FBI agents stormed the warehouse. In the chaos, I barely registered the shouts and the sounds of struggle until Agent Thompson cut through my restraints, pulling me to safety. In the aftermath, our family grappled with the echoes of terror that had invaded our lives. The apartment, once a symbol of new beginnings, now felt haunted by the events that transpired within its walls. We decided to move, seeking a fresh start away from the shadows of the past. The FBI's investigation eventually uncovered that Michael Harrow had indeed died shortly after entering witness protection. His death, obscured by secrecy to protect the investigation, had now been avenged with the dismantling of the syndicate that targeted him. As we packed to leave, I discovered a loose tile in the bathroom. Behind it was a note from Michael, his handwriting shaky. I'm sorry to whoever finds this. I brought danger to this place. Leave before they mistake you for me. His words, a chilling reminder of our entanglement in his fate, urged us forward to our new life, away from the remnants of his. The operation led to the arrest of key syndicate leaders, significantly crippling their operations. As we drove away from the scene, the relief was palpable. But so was the realization of how close we had come to disaster. The threat was neutralized, and finally, we could breathe again, the weight of constant fear lifting slowly from our shoulders. We finally did it. We moved into our own home, a charming old house that whispered tales of decades past with every creaking floorboard and drafty window. It was ours, a place to plant roots, quite literally, 
as our first family project was to overhaul the neglected backyard. My wife Anna, our two kids Josh and Ellie and I, were all buzzing with ideas and the energy of new beginnings. We envisioned vegetable patches, a new swing set, and maybe a small pond. The excavation began on a crisp Saturday morning. Armed with shovels and boundless enthusiasm, we dug into the earth, which was surprisingly soft and yielding. I was in the midst of discussing flower choices with Ellie when my shovel clinked against something hard. Curious, we all gathered around, brushing away dirt to reveal several old rusty suitcases, much to our astonishment. Heartbeats quickening with the thrill of the unknown, we dragged them out and pried them open right there in the garden. Inside, we found an assortment of personal belongings, faded photographs, clothes that smelled of mothballs, and beneath it all, a collection of yellow documents. As I flipped through them, a ledger filled with meticulous entries of names and numbers caught my eye, hinting at transactions that were anything but ordinary. Little did we know, our dream home was about to plunge us into a hidden world of long-buried secrets and looming threats. That evening, as the kids slept, Anna and I spread the contents of the suitcases across our dining room table under the dim overhead light. Our initial amusement at the vintage personal items quickly evaporated as we examined the ledger more closely. It was a detailed account of names, dates, and financial transactions, all meticulously recorded in fading ink. Some entries were marked with cryptic notations like settled or unfinished. The sheer volume of entries suggested these weren't just personal loans among friends, but something more sinister. The realization hit us hard. The weight of our discovery pressed heavily in the air between us. Anna looked up at me, her face pale. What have we gotten ourselves into? I had no answers. Only a growing sense of unease as the history of our dream house began to reveal its dark secrets. The unsettling discovery of the ledger was only the beginning. Within days, the tranquility of our new life was shattered by a series of ominous phone calls. The first few I dismissed as pranks, until a voice, cold and menacing, made it clear they were anything but. Return what you found, or suffer the consequences. The caller warned before the line went deed. Letters began to appear in our mailbox, each more threatening than the last, all demanding the return of the ledger. The realization that some of the names in that old book were not just echoes from the past, but very real and very dangerous figures in the present criminal underworld sent chills down my spine. These people were desperate to keep their secrets buried, and we were caught in the middle with the key to their hidden skeletons. Late one night, Anna and I sat at our kitchen table, the ledger opened between us. We can't just give this back, Anna whispered, fear lacing her voice. Not when it might be the only thing keeping us safe. Her words resonated with a hard truth. If we returned the ledger, we'd lose any leverage we had over the shadows encroaching on our lives. So, we made a decision. We would hold on to the ledger and use it as a shield. I contacted a lawyer friend for advice and drafted an anonymous message to send back to our harassers. We know what's in the ledger. We are prepared to go to the police if our family comes to any harm. It was a risky bluff, especially since we were uncertain of just how deep and dark the roots of this conspiracy ran. Our gamble sent a clear signal. We weren't going to be easy targets. But as I sent that message, part of me knew we were stepping deeper into a game that was far bigger and more dangerous than anything we could have imagined. Determined to protect our family yet desperate to end the nightmare, we chose to contact one of the less menacing names listed in the ledger. Through a secure, anonymous email, we offered a trade, the ledger for our safety. The response was swift and terse, agreeing to meet at an abandoned warehouse at the edge of town. The stakes were high, but we felt this was our best chance to sever ties with this hidden world. The night before the meeting, Anna and I sat down with the kids at the dinner table. We didn't disclose the full danger of the situation, but we stressed the importance of staying with their grandparents for a few days. Just a little vacation while mom and dad take care of some grown-up stuff, I explained, masking my anxiety with a forced smile. After dropping the kids off, Anna and I prepared for every conceivable outcome. 
I contacted our lawyer friend again, giving him details of the meeting and instructing him to act if he didn't hear from us within a few hours. We packed a small bag with essentials, including a discreetly placed voice recorder to document the exchange. Our every move was calculated, yet as we drove to the warehouse, the weight of our decision pressed heavily on us. This was it, a pivotal moment on which our future hinged. The warehouse loomed before us, a silent behemoth in the twilight, its walls scarred with graffiti. Our hearts pounded in unison as we parked the car in the shadow of the structure and proceeded on foot, the ledger secure in my backpack. The air was thick with the acrid smell of old oil and rust as we entered the cavernous space. Inside, figures emerged from the darkness. Their faces were hard and unreadable, their eyes reflecting no emotion. The leader, a tall man with a scar tracing down his cheek, stepped forward. The ledger, he demanded gruffly, his hand extended. As I reached into my backpack, every nerve in my body screamed in tension. I handed over the ledger, and for a moment, there was a heavy silence as he flipped through it. Just as he nodded to his companions, a sudden cacophony of sirens wailed in the distance, growing louder. The criminals tensed, eyes darting toward the sound. The police, led by our family friend from the force, stormed into the warehouse. Lights flashed, and officers shouted commands. Caught by surprise, the criminals were quickly subdued and handcuffed. Our family friend approached, his expression a mix of relief and sternness. You shouldn't have had to do this, he said, clapping a reassuring hand on my shoulder as the police began securing the scene. Relief washed over us in an overwhelming wave. The intervention was timely and decisive, pulling us back from the brink of a potentially disastrous confrontation. Our gamble had paid off, but the real implications of our actions were just beginning to dawn on us. As the dust settled, and the last of the suspects were led away, our family friend and officer, Sergeant Miller, joined us away from the chaos. His usual composed demeanor was replaced by a reflective, almost remorseful expression. There's something you need to know about why I've been so involved, he began, his voice low. He revealed that the original owner of our house was his great uncle, a man whose life had spiraled into the underworld, tainting their family name with criminal associations. When you found the ledger and these threats began, I saw a chance to right some of the wrongs, to clear our family's name and protect yours, he explained. The revelation added layers to our tumultuous experience, intertwining our fate with his in ways we had never imagined. Sergeant Miller's personal stake in the matter had driven him to ensure our safety, bridging past and present in a bid for redemption and justice. In the quiet of our new home, far from the shadows of the past, Anna and I watched the kids play, their laughter a soothing balm. As we unpacked the last of the boxes, Ellie, our youngest, called out from the attic, Look what I found. Her small hands held open a secret compartment hidden beneath the floorboards. Inside, an array of old, dusty letters lay waiting. As our eyes met over her discovery, the familiar thrill of curiosity was tempered with a cautious edge. Our new chapter had just begun, and already, the pages seemed filled with whispers of secrets yet to be revealed. Alex and I crossed the threshold of the old Victorian house, our hearts filled with a blend of awe and the thrill of new beginnings. Its towering presence in the quiet suburbs seemed to command respect, its ornate woodwork and sprawling ivy whispering stories of times long past. It was exactly the kind of home we had dreamed of, a place with character and history where we could plant roots and start our family. As I walked through each room, touching the cool, elaborate moldings and peering out the large bay windows, I could almost hear the echoes of laughter and life that once filled these spaces. Alex, ever the dreamer, was already planning renovations and imagining our future children playing in the lush garden. It's perfect, Mia, he said with a smile that warmed the chilliest corners of the old home. On our second day, curiosity led us up the narrow attic stairs. The air was thick with dust and the scent of age, but it was the old leather-bound journals piled in the corner that caught my attention. Their covers were worn, the pages yellowed, a testament to their age and the hands that had turned them over the decades. I pulled one from the stack and opened it, the spine creaking like the house settling around us. 
The script was elegant, penned with an intensity that immediately drew me in. It was the diary of Charles, a former owner, who wrote with a fervent passion about his wife, Eleanor. But as I flipped through the pages, the tone darkened. Charles's adoration seemed to slip into obsession, his love tainted with a possessiveness that sent a shiver down my spine. Glancing over at Alex, who was exploring the other end of the attic, I tucked the journal under my arm. This discovery, I thought, might just tell us more about the home we had fallen in love with, revealing layers of its past that were not visible in the wood and stone. Little did I know, the words of Charles would soon begin to haunt me, threading a sense of foreboding through our hopeful dreams. As the days turned into weeks, my mornings began with coffee and Charles's journals. The more I read, the deeper I was drawn into the turbulent world of his love for Eleanor. His words were poetic, but fraught with an intensity that bordered on obsession. He spoke of Eleanor as if she were both a treasure to cherish and a possession to guard jealously against imagined threats. It was disturbing, yet I couldn't pull myself away. One chilly evening, as I sat reading by the fire, I came across an entry that chilled me to the bone. Charles had written, I know they whisper to her about me. The walls have ears and eyes. I shivered, trying to dismiss it as the paranoia of a troubled man, but I couldn't shake the feeling that someone might be watching me as well. That night, as I walked through the hallway, every shadow seemed to flicker unnaturally, and every creak of the old house sounded like footsteps following close behind me. My nerves frayed, and soon I began noticing things that I couldn't explain. Notes I didn't remember writing appeared on my desk. Be careful, one said. They're watching, said another. Whether they were pranks from my frazzled mind or something more sinister, I couldn't tell. But they mirrored Charles's accounts of receiving ominous messages. Alex saw the change in me. Initially, he was supportive, laughing off my fears as an overactive imagination fueled by too much time spent in Charles's headspace. But as my paranoia grew, so did his concern. I found myself jumping at the slightest sound, double-checking locked doors, peering into the shadows expecting to see eyes staring back. Mia, maybe you should take a break from those journals, Alex suggested one evening, his voice laced with worry. He missed our quiet evenings together, the simple joy of sharing our day's experiences. I knew he felt pushed aside replaced by the ghost of a man who hadn't walked these halls in nearly a century, but I couldn't stop. There was something compelling about Charles's fear and love, something that resonated too closely with my own insecurities. Alex's presence became less comforting as my mind twisted normalcy into fear. Each day, his late returns from work made me anxious, and his unguarded phone seemed a beacon of secrets he might be keeping from me, just as Charles believed Eleanor had done. My relationship with Alex began to strain under the weight of my growing obsession and paranoia. The house, with its echoing halls and whispering walls, felt less like a home and more like a puzzle that I was desperate to solve, even if it meant losing everything else in the process. My obsession reached its peak late one stormy night when the wind howled like the wailing of a lost soul around the eaves of our Victorian home. The journal's last entries had become increasingly erratic and Charles's desperation to uncover truths he believed Eleanor hid from him echoed my own frantic need for answers. I was convinced that the house held secrets related to Eleanor's fate, secrets buried in its very bones. I roamed the house, ignoring the storm's cacophony outside, my mind racing with thoughts of hidden compartments, false walls, anything that might hold the answers Charles had sought. My every waking moment was consumed with finding the heart of this mystery, convinced that if I could just unravel this one thread, everything would make sense again. Alex found me in the attic, papers strewn around me, eyes wild with lack of sleep. Mia, this has to stop, he said, his voice firm but tinged with desperation. You're losing yourself to a ghost, to a story that isn't ours. The confrontation that followed was heated and full of pent-up frustrations. I accused him of not understanding, of not seeing how important this was. He shot back, hurt and angry, decrying how I had let my fear in this obsession isolate me from him and from our life together. Our words, sharp and reckless, seemed to hang in the air, as heavy as the rain outside. 
driven by a mix of anger and a desperate need to prove myself. I stormed off to the one part of the house we hadn't fully explored, the cellar. There, behind old wine racks, I discovered a false wall. Trembling, I pried it open, revealing a hidden room. Inside, amidst the dust and cobwebs, were Eleanor's personal effects, her diary among them. It chronicled her life with Charles, her fear of his jealousy, and her plans to leave him. A plan that, I learned, led to her tragic end during a confrontation much like the one I had just had with Alex. The revelation hit me like a physical blow. The parallels between Eleanor's fears and my own current reality sent a chill through me. I understood then how deeply I had been drawn into reliving Eleanor's nightmare. Sitting among the relics of her life, I realized how my obsession had almost driven me to the brink of losing everything I held dear. I returned to Alex, the journals in Eleanor's diary in my arms, tears streaming down my face. The truth about Charles and Eleanor was out, a grim reminder of how easily love could turn into something destructive. I had to make a choice, to let go of the past and hold on to the life and love I still had. As the storm subsided, Alex and I sat quietly together, the weight of our earlier words and my discovery pressing down on us. We both realized how dangerously close I had come to losing myself in Charles and Eleanor's story, letting their tragic past seep into our own lives. This ordeal was a stark reminder that the shadows of history can loom large, casting long, dark echoes across the years. It was a lesson in how obsessions, if left unchecked, can consume not only the obsessed, but also those they love. In the light of the revelations, our home felt different, as if acknowledging its past had somehow freed us both. We understood that to move forward, we needed to leave the haunting legacy of the house behind, embracing our future with open, vigilant hearts. As we packed our belongings, it was clear that the experience had left an indelible mark on me. It had taught me about the fragility of trust and the strength needed to confront and overcome our deepest fears. Moving forward, I carried with me a newfound resolve to cherish the present and to nurture the bonds that truly matter.